Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I have Mary and Rodrigo. How are we doing today, guys? Wonderful. Great. Great. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm really excited about it. Um, I actually know Mary's aunt, somebody I actually work with in the professional world, but we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about food today. We're going to talk about Cocina Kin, but that's not all that you guys do. So we're going to, we're going to first, let's introduce the world to Mary and Rodrigo. Can you guys give them a little background, who you guys are, and then we'll kind of get into the business. Uh, first, it's Comida Kin. Oh, sorry, Comida oh, yeah. Kin. <laughs> not kitchen, <laughs> but <food. laughs> Uh, yeah, my name's Mary Hatz. I was born and raised in Hillsboro, Oregon. Um, uh, what else do you want to know? I went to um, Limbenton Community College and Oregon State University with a Bachelor of Science for Restaurant Food Service Management. Um, and culinary school is where Rodrigo and I met. Nice. So what, what's culinary school? The Limbenton Community College. Okay. And Rodrigo, what about you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So school just kind of started late for me, but yeah, we met in Lindbergh Community College. Um, I was born here in Portland, uh, moved around quite a bit up in Washington, went back east, uh, to Pittsburgh for a while, and came, um, settled back in Oregon. And that, you know, that's about every six years transitions moving and um went to school and uh was you know when i was gardening a lot at some point in my life and was in a horticulture program but realizing that uh, studying science at the moment wasn't at the time wasn't my thing and the books i just they're just too big <laughs> for me so but i realized that uh there was um uh, so i found out that this little where i was studying the horticulture um, had the culinary program and so I mean I got into that pretty quickly and because when I was you know at home from school I was also I was watching was Food Network and cooking at home and learning learning to cook but also realizing that I could cook I had background my my dad was a chef and we had a family Mexican restaurant and and so I was like oh wait a second this is all familiar to me <laughs> so it was easy move you. and sorry uh, yeah yeah, it was an easy move to uh, for a career path, and um, you know that's a two-year program. Uh, like Mary and I were in in each other's vision the first year, but it was at the end of the first year that we actually met, and then um, we're pretty tight in the set the second year throughout the the rest of the school. And then we got married in 2011. Mm -hmm. We moved to, from Corvallis to Portland in 2009 and worked in Portland restaurants um, for, I don't know, around seven years. Yeah. Went to Mexico for a few years and then moved, or not years, but <laughs> for a few months, um, traveled around for nine months and then moved to, uh, after that we came back and ended up in Hillsborough at some point. Yeah. <laughs> so what, a little so why, more traveling. <laughs> yeah, so why culinary school? Uh, for me, um, I was at OSU my freshman year. It wasn't going very well. I didn't know what to do, wasn't enjoying it. And I went and talked to my advisor and she said, well, you know, we have a, we have a, just started a program where you go to culinary school and then you take a business school from osu and so it's a partnership between the community college and osu oh interesting um, and i said well i'll give it a shot because it was the culinary school aspect and i loved it so much i was only supposed to, i was only required to do one year i loved it so much i did it for the both two years um and then i finished at osu nice so let's let's talk about the transition because you mentioned you both you know traveled and then you went from working in Portland restaurants to eventually going to Mexico for a couple of months and then coming back and, and starting this food cart. What what made you decide? What kind of gave you that? Okay, we're ready to start our own. We're ready to venture out on our own without doing the restaurant. What what, what was kind of that aha moment for you? Um, I think it was 
the abridged version is the pandemic. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's hear it. I mean, yeah, yeah, the pandemic was, well, I think the pandemic started the business, but I would say first, um, you know, we worked, we moved to Portland working to get, uh, and we got a job together um, at a hotel restaurant. And pretty much, I mean, that was just the chops where he had to, that broke in our chops real quick. It was a hotel. We were doing hundreds of covers in a couple hours and, you know, like a Cadillac of a line station, a, a cooking line and two people per station, just busting out food. And, you know, it was fine dining. And so we were touching all sorts of things, mostly seafood for me personally, um, that we, you know, we're touching things again that we touched in culinary school because after culinary school, I was like in pubs and co-ops and just cooking and just really learning food again, um, you know, in the real world. And, and then we got into the restaurant and learned the restaurant game in the real world. And, um, and then, you know, so, but we also realized real quick that, I mean, burnout was there and it was present and, but we do, you know, we couldn't take that as our professional, well, not professional burnout yet, but job burnout every, you know, I mean, I left after the first nine months, I think for at least a year. And then I kept moving around, but my, you know, I wanted to learn as much as I could. Uh, I mean, different cuisines, different chefs, different kitchens, different coworkers. Now we're all the same, honestly, <laughs> the coworkers, but, um, uh, but, then uh, we ended up managing, uh, working together at a, after Mexico, we actually got hired at a taqueria while in Mexico. Oh, interesting. Uh, I got hired in the last few months as a sous chef and then um, started working there. Uh, when we got back, like two days after traveling for nine months, just started hitting the grind again and um, started working, getting settled. And uh, I'm not, I don't remember if Mary joined me there right away or later but eventually we ended up working together um and she was we ended up working together in this restaurant and in that we were kind of like oh this is too much like it's just the stress and it wasn't ours and but there's this you know the two of us I was kind of a, I was a chef Mary was kind of a sous chef and we felt this we felt this ownership but it wasn't ours, you know, but we, we did have this ownership and it was, we did keep it consistent in that way, but everything else beside that was just out of our control and, and very intense dealing with. Um, so we kind of promised each other never to own a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and we ever, we ever get into this situation, we should stay out of it. <laughs> um, so then in 2019, we found ourselves, uh, we bought this food truck and um the plan was that we were going to just use it every like during the summer for like once a month do a festival you know as a side gig um just to make some extra cash but then uh the pandemic hit and we i was at a catering company at that time and catering ceased to exist so i had no job and rodrigo was already out of work transitioning into something else but then that didn't follow through because pandemic um, so we found ourselves unemployed with a truck we said well I guess we'll start cooking <laughs> yeah yeah we started I started working on the truck in the winter just replacing the equipment and again the plan was to find a job and then get on the festival certificate do that part-time and have steady income coming um, but uh yeah the pandemic had some different plans and um, we were pretty, yeah. And so we just, what can we do? And um, I'd worked in a restaurant in downtown Hillsboro um, for about a year or so. And uh, I became familiar with the farmer's market and, you know, did, did uh, they had like a, a market kitchen thing where I, when I was a chef at this restaurant, um, you know, she asked if I'd be willing to do a demonstration and we did a demonstration at the market and um, thought that was pretty cool and fun. The market itself was just awesome. It's good to be a part of, be out of the restaurant that everybody walked by during the market because the market's going on and, and to be into the market and uh, 
feel like uh, you know we're we're being a part of it. And um, so uh, we had a number to call when um, it was time to start the business, and um, called uh, the manager, at the farmers market, and easy, you know, no problem getting in. And you know, we had to do the, go through the trials, and you know, again, no problem. And um, yeah, I just started figuring out how to do it because <laughs> there was you know we were it, it was all pretty on I mean, we were fly. on the fly I mean we were scrambling to get sign up on the truck for the first day <laughs> we had paper we had a paper sign with each paper with the letter of comida wow. Kin. <laughs> wow. so with so many food carts out there how how do you guys differentiate yourself we are strictly seasonal farm to table cuisine. Uh, we only buy from local farms for our oh, produce cool. and our awesome. meat, eggs, grains, grains, uh, not all the grains, but uh, as much as we can. Um, Corn and beans. Because we're, I mean, we're in the heart of agriculture out here, surrounded by so many small farms. Um, who are doing really good regenerative organic practices. Um, and who've had to go to regenerative because, you know, when Mary's a kid growing up out here, it was all farm. Yeah, that's very true. I grew up in Mount Angel, Oregon, and, we, you know, I farmed the Willamette Valley myself. And so we are in the mecca of, of really the, when it comes to the fruits and vegetables, or more so the vegetables, right? We're kind of in the area. You get the fruit down in the Northern California area, but yeah, Willamette Valley has, is just ripe with produce. It really yeah. is. Yeah. And so, so what, who are the, some of the businesses or some of the organizations, farms that you guys currently work with? Oh, it's a list. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's give them a shout out. I'll, I'll, I'll name off three of them. Uh, Perfect. Sparrowhawk Farm. Stoneboat Farm, and that's connected with Campo Collective and De Leon Farms. Um, yeah, we started working with Working Theory Farm, um, Pruitt's Farm. Yeah, there's Pruitt's Farm out in Cornelius. There's uh, a Edible Stories Market Garden, La Finquita de Bujo. Um, Mason Hill Cattle, Mason Hill Cattle, Tabula, Tabula Rasa, Rasa, Tuolumne Plains, Great Grains. Wow. wow! And the list just keeps growing. It started Sun with first, Farm. It started with two or three farmers, and it's just grown. Yeah, awesome. it, yeah. This year, as a as we saw business grow exponentially, <laughs> as every year, <laughs> um, the we found and we picked up fest, a festival again and some bigger larger events this year again i was i was kind of concerned about what the farm to to be able to produce to be able to have enough vegetables for you know hundreds of people a day gotcha. which yeah. you know in the festival we're going to be doing thousands a thousand or two and um i was pretty concerned about sticking i want to stick to, we, we have values and we want to stick to them right, and we're right. we see that i mean we, we support the local agriculture local agriculture and you know i wanted to i want to keep supporting him especially with this big event for us because i mean the the festivals paid off the truck for us in two weekends wow. and, and so you know we we know there's a lot of money needed um you know we invest a lot into going under those but we sell a lot. And so we wanted to help out. So I had to, I did some more, you know, I was like, just kind of expanded the web a bit more. Yeah, yeah do some outreach. Started reaching out yeah. to find some more farmers and um, so that, you know, we could, we can do what we want to do. Yeah. And how, so one, one thing I want to, first I want to kind of make sure the listeners. So folks, I, I hope you are hearing that if you buy actually a meal from this food cart, you're supporting so many local farmers because the produce is actually coming directly from these individuals. So that's just one other reason why it's also important to kind of continue to help support our local entrepreneurs because they also have connections. Now, you know, you're talking about, um, you know, the networking and kind of building out that network. How important has the network been to grow your business? 100%. 100%. It's huge um, because people come to us because they hear from, somebody else at the farm and you know the craziest thing about it is it, it's not even well we too have just met so many people in the community 
um, just in relation to, and, and pretty much feeling like we're hugely involved in the community because of relation too, is as far as like, well, the, you know, well, we already know each other and, yeah. Or, yeah, you know, this, there, there's so many, it's a small world, you know, yeah. Yeah. and uh, we're in a small town and it's, it's spread out as Hillsboro seems some, um, you really, you really, what it, it did in my eyes kind of centered us more into, in, um, into our community and fun and realizing who our community is and, um, <clears throat> You know that, like again, so spread out, so many different um, walks of life in a town. But uh, you know, and it's hard to share with all of that. It's hard to take. It's hard to um, have all of those experiences from all different ranges. But when you have that community, the support is huge and it's immense. Yeah. Um, and you really, you really, it really helps us stay focused and. Um, in our values and our goals, our missions, and um, you know, and that's it, the experience of just being able to eat ourselves this food and and work with it and understand it more um, has changed our lifestyles uh, personally. For me, definitely, um, I know <clears throat> Mary too has always been a vegetable eater, but I mean now even more. And um, but uh, you know, and that seeing that in our self-improvement with, you yeah. know, the, um, these, this stuff and, and, and our community and understanding why they do what they do, yep. you know, really, um, really been a, a good thing for us and, uh, you know, helps us want to share that. I like it. Now, what would you, what would you two say has, you know, this is, you mentioned you didn't want to get into the restaurant industry, but now you've gotten into the food cart industry. What, what would you say has been difficult about starting the food cart business? Everything. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, um, rest is, rest is the first thing I, that comes to my mind. Well, and you know, one of the first things they teach you in business school is that when you first start a business, it's, it's a pendulum. It's going to be all work. It starts, it's all work. It's gonna be all work because it's, you just have to put everything, every ounce of your day into it to get it up and running and trying to find that balance. And we're, so just reminding ourselves that when we started this because we didn't wanna get into the restaurant because of burnout, but we're working, you know, 70 hours, 80 hours a week, still but it's for ourselves it's on our own time and eventually as systems get in put into place and work themselves out things get smoother um, and you're we're able to find a little bit of time here and there now for rest and um, finding places where you can put those boundaries in practice of like this one day a month i'm not doing anything and you know, starting small with that too, of uh, how do you incorporate that balance and get that pendulum to slowly shift so it's a little more in the middle. Great point. Yeah, and the um, the it's our own stress too. You know, it's like we create it. Yeah, we can we can get rid of it if you know if it's too much. Um, that we have that power. And uh, it's very, you know, at being our third year of Comedian too, um, we've learned and, and found, um, you know, we've been able to streamline and fit, and we we had the grace of the customers to do what we wanted for the first year, year and a half, and then by the end of the second year we were we had a kind of a steady menu and, and a concept that was <laughs> that we felt we could work with and not and and we're gonna that we found the consistency and the streamline and yeah. and then with that you know the space and the time opens up for um our personal lives and um in the community and in these extra projects and also um we are able to 
be more the consistency has been able to sorry i lost my train yeah. of thought oh you're good <laughs> well you know one of the things you guys were talking talking about was stress right you guys were talking right. about the but have you guys ever, since you started this food cart, have you ever had a moment of self-doubt? Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah. Um, many times. <laughs> uh, especially the, you know, the, the second year. This year, so there's been no time to doubt anything. <laughs> to be, um, which is, you know, it's great. Keeps us busy. But, you know, uh, there's, we were looking at, you know talking about what what can keep us up at night sometimes and um you know that the freedom has really washed away a lot of the stress of oh i forgot this so and so is going to be on me about this or you know the responsibility to somebody else or 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 blame you know that kind of thing scenario but it's really the personal things we take on and and whether, and, and then are conscious about it, you know, that, that can keep us um, stewing at night or, you know, what if this, what if that, but you nowadays, I think, um, you know, the, the doubt, it creeps in, but only when chaos is around. <laughs> yeah. When there's chaos and there's just the two of us. And when, you know, because there's just the two of us, chaos can happen real quick uh during service when it gets busy because uh if we're you know, not ready if we're not yeah prepared. if there's if there's less preparation which um if it we, can happen sometimes we might judge a, a we might judge an opening differently as far as like uh well, i can wait or i'll i'll try to get this in and um uh, we take those risks to create yeah. time for ourselves too you know and so walking into something like that it's uh you get busy and all of a sudden, you know, you, the service is over. And I'm, I look at Mary, I'm like, what happened? Was everything okay? <laughs> like, <laughs> how was the food? You know, yeah. so, you know, we do a lot, we do a lot ahead as far as the preparation to make sure that there's not really, you know, the chance of screwing the, the food and, and how people see our food with, with flavor and texture. It's hard to screw that up. You know, we try to set that up where it's just, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a wait or, you know, time and, um, and whether they really enjoy it or not, uh, that, you know, is something to worry about. But when I can't remember what I, you know, what I, the first couple of years, it was so, a little, so slow, so much slower that I remember, could remember every dish I put out. Um, some of these other days when you, I can't remember these dishes, I kind of get a little anxiety about <laughs> what, how food was and why because you know just it's been a shift of remembering everything of touch to not remembering things of touch and um so and you know getting, getting our menus um streamlined has helped a lot too because we at first we were changing our menu a lot um i mean because we are seasonal some one week our farmer will have something and the next week you won't and so we would make whole new dishes around those around these things but so we're as, creative. as time went on we we're like this is too much we couldn't keep track of everything yeah. and so there was doubt, doubt a lot of doubt <laughs> but then once we realized that no we just need to do you know we'd take we started with a menu that was 12 items big and we just slowly chipped away and said nope it's too much nope it's too much and until we had four items on our menu because that's what the two of us could handle yeah. And now it's um, tacos, tamale, a sandwich, soup, salad, cornbread. And within those concepts, we change what's in them. Gotcha. Gotcha. Nice. Now, one of the things you mentioned when you started the, the food cart or the, the food kind of going around and doing the different farmer's markets, you were able to pay off the, the truck in two weeks. So how did you guys actually finance the finance the company beforehand? It's all grassroots. Did you got to do venture capital. Did you have to take any loans out, or just just like let's just let's just roll up the sleeves and do it? How did you guys finance this? Well, and when we first were offered the food truck, um, it was with these large festivals. So we did Pride Festival and the Seattle to Portland bike race. Oh, nice! Yeah, yeah. 
Those um, are huge festivals too. Huge. Wow. Our very first experience in the food truck was Pride Festival. <laughs> first time I jumped in it. Yeah, so, talking about swimming with the sharks pretty quickly. Yeah. Eh? That, was, that grossed us eighteen thousand dollars in wow. one week. That's incredible. And we, I mean, we've never opened the truck before, so wow. um, we between that and the STP, we were able to pay it off, and then with the uh, uh, for the first half of it, we had our we took our personal savings and invest in personal money and then the other half or half of it and then the other half we paid off with the two festivals and i want to quickly do one another shout out uh the crave catering where mary worked and i worked and who we bought the truck from you know they really set us up for success and you know he they wanted to get rid of the truck they did they had more business and kind of just wanted to stick to their guns and push the truck thing aside but uh, they really lined us up with logistics and, and made, you know, really helped us be successful um, in that. And, uh, and for us, it was like, it was easy to understand. Yeah. I mean, I didn't, you know, it's like, ah, is this really going to happen? You, like, yeah. I'm going to have like 40 people or uh, 80 people just standing in line and I'm supposed to be serving them the whole time all at once. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things you guys actually, because I'm, so I'm, let's, I'm not a food person, right? I'm, I'm, I love food, but I've never like cooked and nothing like that. Let's go through that process. What, what do you really, what is the preparation? You mentioned the preparation process. What are some of the things that people in the food industry that maybe us as the consumer don't really think about that you have to think about? What are some of those preparation things that you have to go through that we don't think about as a consumer? First, we have to make a menu. Then we have to look at our farms and see what produce is available and then we put our order together so there, basically there's a lot of office work air quotes office work that goes into getting ready before you even touch the food so then once we put our orders in then we have to go drive around and pick up all of our produce so we probably spend about three hours a week if not more driving to the different farms because with the local farms there's no delivery service like there is from large food service um like an fsa or cisco right right so we spend a lot of time there is um depending on where you live and because right. they do yeah. deliver to portland yeah they can't come around here but they all don't because um not all the farms we buy from service the restaurants uh, right okay. so we pick up and then we have to clean every vegetable because the farmers, they'll do, their, it's called a field wash, but it's just to get like the big clumps of right. big, yep. basic dirt off. Just hose then, down. Yeah. So then we have to wash the vegetables and then we have to prep the vegetables, clean them, uh, you know, chop them, cook them before they even get into the dish that they're going to be. Wow. And then that menu, you know, with, when you're thinking about vegetarian food, you know, because Oh. We didn't want to stick to. Um, we started out vegetarian. Yeah, we started oh, out vegetarian okay. because we, you know, the meat. We just a lot of personal values and yeah, and, yeah. You know, we see the meat industries and um, the uh, our yeah. opinions around that. But um, so okay. developing a menu uh, with these vegetables, you know, we do have to, we have to think about nutrition. How yeah. Like, yeah. is it? okay this is good is this going to be satiating are we going to satiate the customer with this like how are we going to work this in and is it going to get them protein are they going to get be enough nutrients to not have protein this meal or whatever oh man didn't i just see those i would never have thought about that stuff yeah i mean like so like a lot of a lot and then the vegan things you know when we we're talking about vegan we're like well cheese can really replace a lot uh, but uh you know, we're like, oh, nuts and seeds and, and you know, and Mexican food and researching more, doing more research and um, getting into pre-Hispanic um, foods. You got pepitas, sesame seeds, you got these ancient grains and all, you, you got the maize, the corn and um, beans. the beans. And so like developing a vegan Mexican menu is really easy <laughs> yeah true. But keeping it seasonally seasonal right, that's, was, yeah. the tough was is the challenge and um so 
that took work and that took confidence, um, you know, and and doing that stuff. And but we ha- with that we had to stop playing around with the special, that special, really find that rhythm and stick to, okay, well, I we are going to do tacos. We are going to have tacos all the time. So what can we do to make, uh, you know, what, what can we quick work, work with to have a filling, satiating um, taco that uh, isn't full of just carnitas and, or, um, or carne asada, which, you know, we love, right. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, how can we, how can we replicate some of that stuff? And, uh, and then, you know, trends, you start following trends and you're like, well, can we replace that birria with some potatoes and cheese? And, oh, you know, yeah. Queso? <laughs> yeah. And, you, you know, you know. I, you're, one thing you're also doing is, is, is kind of keeping our community healthy as well. Because one thing I don't think people understand, you, you were mentioning it was really easy to create a vegan menu with the Latino, the Mexican, you know, culture and their food. Because historically Latinos, you know, Mexicans, we, we kind of really focus on eating our, the agriculture, right? We, we, we filled in the lands and we ate what we, what we worked with. And that's why you actually see, you know, diabetes at such a high rate in the native American population and the Hispanic population and the African American population is because historically our bodies were not used to this processed food that the McDonald's and Taco Bell's that we're now consuming. And so when we do consume those at a rapid rate, and especially at when you're going to Taco Bell and you see a sign that literally says sodium warning on it, and you're just, you know, and you're still consuming that meal, that is really going to have some effects on your body as well. And so what you guys are really doing is beyond just having us eat healthy, you're really actually creating a healthy community. So I really do applaud you that. And not only that, but working with, you know, other local farmers is such a, such an amazing idea and seeing it continue to uh, grow has really been really, really unique. Now, is this your first, is this both of your first businesses? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, um, to reply to, you know, thank you for seeing that. Um, it, it took us a while to, it's, it's hard to tell people, you know, you don't want to tell people that they're eating wrong. You don't want to oh, say, hey, yeah. you know, like you should eat this, not that. And leading by example is kind of just the way to do it. Um, it's how we've changed. We started eating it. You know, we're very fortunate to do that. Um, so we, we've seen that and felt the pressure to personally to be able to share it, but also the pressure to try to help with um, you know, bringing awareness to that. Yeah. And we've been able to create some programs um, right now. It's our, only our second month, but we have this, um, it's called Kin Care Program where um, we're just, you know, kind of crowdfunding with our customers. They've been very generous when we ask for things because uh, we do, a, you know, we do a free meal, free breakfast on Mondays, um, serving a, a community here um, near our house mm-hmm. and where we operate the food truck. Um, but we wanted to be more active, involved. Um, and and instead of just that, that Monday, we want people to be able to come to the truck and- Yeah. Um, be more accessible to- um, eat- everybody yeah because and- our price point is kind of high because we are local farmed yeah um, so we we started this kin care fund where we're we asked it's basically a pay it forward program where it's a donation base from our customers and then we take those donations we turn them into gift cards and then we partner with local organizations in the community who work with underserved or challenged folks who are Hispanic, uh, the Hispanic community. Um, so we, the last, our first month we did a lady who helps, um, uh, um, so beautiful dream, uh, they go out and help uh, people with disabilities, you know, integrate into life and, and they, they help build, uh, their personal, strengths and and to get them to be able to live a regular normal life um, without all the assistance and um but with assistance but also yeah. be comfortable and give them pride and um, all that 
Wow. We're going to, we're going to connect more about this offline. Yeah. Uh, we're going to, yeah. we're going to we'll talk more about the, we'll definitely get into the nonprofit world offline. I think me and you we might be able to do some collaborative work on that as well. Now, from the business perspective, you know, you mentioned this is your first business. What has been difficult? Oh, um, honestly, uh, being in the, being in the capitalist world <laughs> is, <laughs> it is, that is our, our biggest, uh, our biggest challenge because we, you know, we have strong feelings about accessible food. And um, so that's, and that's kind of where, where that was leading to is like our, who we're supporting now is, um, but so as a business, the challenges of um, being so small, it hasn't been crazy challenging with, you know, we have, finding a tax person we've been able to, to keep our stuff in check and yeah. um being small it's easy to uh it's easy to just keep track of all of that it takes time and work and um i'm not gonna i guess i'm not gonna mary does most of that so i'm not gonna say it's necessarily easy <laughs> but it's very time consuming yeah um, my goodness i experienced a little bit of it you know in the beginning but I'd say just do it, having to do everything ourselves because we don't have the budget to hire an accountant right. or hire a or delivery or get deliveries. And, yeah. Um, you know, we have to do every single thing ourselves. Yeah. And that, I think that's just, you know, that playing into time management. Like. So we, and uh, we, with our being in our community, it's very easy to not feel like a capitalist in a way. We have so much, um, our community helps us in so many different ways of just offering, uh, you know, all trying to make each other's lives easier. Working together with um, each other um, and having our little, you know, having our LLC above us, but yeah. underneath we're all just in the, we're weaving, weaving in, our, in between each other and with it's each community, other. baby. We're a community. Yeah. yeah. I like it. What, what, what has been easy? Is, 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 has there been anything easy? Oh, just the every day, just, you know, when we keep working and doing what we do, it just unfolds. Uh, yeah. That's been the easy part. <laughs> to, <laughs> Letting it unfold. Yeah. The, it unfold. the easy, easy part has been not, not worrying about, well, hasn't been that part's not where it, it's been funny how things have come to us you uh, know like yeah. just the like, sticking to our values has has been easy it is it literally makes our choices it, you know we choose on what we buy or don't buy through that or what we do or don't do through that and with that you know has been it, it's created kind of a magnet in a way um yeah. for us yeah because we don't have to spend a lot of time worrying about Oh, should I or shouldn't I? Because if you just check in with your values, is this in line with what I believe? No, then okay. I don't need to. I don't need to spend any more of my time thinking about it. And that is such a great point. In fact, you know, Rodrigo, you mentioned things are starting to come to you. I believe, you know, as as you go throughout life and you give, eventually people start to give back, right? And you, you kind of notice those people. Um, and, and I feel like that's the same way with this podcast, just going out and helping with communities the opportunities that have been coming my way and the collaborations like just today, right? I'm, I'm actually really excited to talk about after this a little bit more about what you guys are doing from your nonprofit perspective, because I think we can have a real um, good impact on the community if we can collaborate as well. And I think already you guys are having a huge impact, you know, even with without a collaboration. And so how do we continue to grow, right, together as a community? One thing I'm always constantly saying is, is we're a, a global community of entrepreneurs, right? Because we're all interconnected in some way or shape or form. Because what's happening out in another country is also going to affect what's happening in our country as well. And so just being mindful of that. So I'm, I'm really excited. Now, I'm going to ask this question to each one of you individually. So first, Mary, I'm going to start with you. What motivates you? I think the extracurricular projects that we're working on is what motivates me to continue with the business because it's through the business that I can do these extra projects and not just our Monday meals and not just our kin care fund, but we're working on other 
uh, you know, uh, starting to get into food policy and with the, um, with the with the community and and hopefully eventually with the city and getting some food policy put into place and um, really shaping the future of food our food economy here in, awesome. in Oregon. Amazing. Mark, same question. What motivates you? Um, change. Um, I think we can get so stuck in our lives and, you know, what, what, what we feel comfortable in, right? But um, to being the third year, you know, like, Yes, the business growing and, and more opportunities coming our way is is motivating, but it can be exhausting. Yeah. But the thing about that is that we've seen change. We know that what's happening is gonna change. It's not gonna and if it and then also looking back to seeing, you know, just what the pandemic has created with the food systems that we have in place yeah. that yeah even think we're systems like we just oh it's food we don't think about this stuff yeah you know not everybody thinks about where they're where where that bacon is coming from Nobody. where is that bacon and, and, really or it. how that pig you know lived the and so <clears throat> getting a little um insight into that stuff and and seeing oh this thing's changing and and um you know being in Portland and then starting a business in Portland or, you know, Oregon and Portland being a Mecca of a farm to fork back in the nineties, if not the eighties, the, you know, that started, but what happened to it? Where did, you know, where did the, those restaurants, they're still, they still are here. They still are there. And you just don't see as many doing a full, like, cause it's a lot of work to, yes. yeah. They're, the, the farms that we buy from are not a part of these systems that uh, that are in place to feed, to, to create convenience um, and feeding. And so change um, and knowing that there, there needs to be change in, in uh, the way we eat, the way we, the way we spend our money, the way we buy, the way we purchase, um, who we spend our money with and, you know, supporting, knowing that wait a second, I don't have to, I can, I can find a way to support my local economy, um, that kind of stuff, you know, that's motivating for me, because it, when you think that you have to, when you, when you think about change, you want to change the world, like, that's the first, uh, this, this could change the world, what a great idea, but that's a nearly impossible, I mean, that's thinking hugely, but what you, what, bringing it back down to center and bringing it back to where you're at, like that change is possible. You just it starts small. It's okay. We, we all were crawling before we were walking. Yep. And, very true. You know, and so um, that is, you know, knowing that change is always going to happen, but uh, being able to notice, see, and uh, be aware of that and have the initiative to do it and, 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 a community that uh, has embraced us. Like we, we feel very hugged. Yeah. <laughs> We're in a big hug of our community Love and it, it, it has been a huge motivating piece for us. That's and, nice. uh, and you know, that's new for us. Yeah. That's it has been. Yeah. Now, what would you guys say as, as small business owners keeps you guys up at night? My stomach. <laughs> <laughs> Eating too late. <laughs> the hour, yeah. Not eating at the right time. And, yeah, and, just those hours, huh? You know, it's... It's not really the stress because there's... It's only us to blame <laughs> if something goes wrong. And, you know, it, it all will get done at some point. And if not, then, well, you just have to say what, what needs to change then to make it doable. Right. So if, if we're not getting done what needs to get done, then the system needs to change. Um, so there's there's not really anything that other than our bad eating habits. <laughs> we, we thought about, you know, we thought about that because it was, I mean, not to just 
joke around either like that's very fortunate for us because yeah. we were really like it's the business right now this year mostly too like you know first second year I could tell you that we probably went to bed just wondering you know those doubts those personal those self-doubts what's going to happen yeah um this year waking up knowing we're we got to get to the truck we have work we have work through the summer those aren't our, you know cooking and making money isn't aren't the anxieties uh necessarily uh, versus you know just being able to take care of ourselves and yeah. whether we took care of ourselves well enough to rest yeah that's night, you know yeah. that's um, a good point and you know folks that are listening if, if you're having trouble sleeping at night and you're eating at like nine or eight o'clock at night, that's probably why. And I know I'm pointing at myself when I'm talking to my, you know, talking to people <laughs> listening because I know, what? I know I do it often <laughs> as well. Now, how do you guys continue to market yourself and grow your brand? How do you guys continue to tell people what you're doing? That is Rodrigo's. Avenue. <laughs> yeah. The, you know, the social media with the Instagram is the only marketing tool we have um the word of mouth our is community, the greatest um doing what we do it's again just sticking to what feels right um uh because you know this at this when we we took a, ro- a small road trip this winter um about four or five weeks and had no idea what the summer's gonna look like and then you know coming back home the anxieties get in. Oh man, what what are we gonna? What's gonna happen? How do we? How are we gonna start booking? And we gotta call them. We this person, that person. We gotta start reaching out to the wineries. We gotta do this, that. In a matter of two weeks, three weeks, when we got home, this we're booked out till September. I mean, just as far as how oh, much wow. work we could do. Um, and then, you know, working with people, trying to figure out other things. All of a sudden, it just stops. Like I can't do anymore. Like we we're, we were hoping to have an April that was going to be a little a uh, little more time to to do to find work, but as May through September filled up, people calling April just filled up as well, and um, you know April was our largest selling month since we've been open. Oh wow! Uh, and it's just it's only growing right now, and uh, so. Yeah, the, the things just started happening and um, like the marketing. Yeah, so uh, so now like the marketing and the growth, it's it's like I just I don't worry too much about it, which is really it helps me at night too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't get <laughs> you know because there, there's all these other things I wanted to do. Like there's so much you can do in marketing, and um, I reached out also again community and people we've worked with before. You know, we work with uh, chefs and uh, that have their own restaurants now, and um, and working with cooks that have their own restaurants now, and calling and being like, "Well, because I like their marketing, how's how's this work for you?" Um, yep. Getting advice and uh, yeah. yep. and and you know, advice of it's raining. If you can't hear, <laughs> oh yeah, I was pouring over here earlier. Don't worry. Yeah, I, uh, the the um, so. You know, I, I talked to a a small um, restaurant that who's who we we worked with, and um, they were very gracious and just sending me their marketing person. Nice. Said, Give this person a call. Talk to him for yeah. You know, we had 15, 20 minute conversation, and and she was very direct with me. Very nice, but very direct. And I was I, you know, I was like, this is awesome. Like, yeah. Just it really just helped me lay out a system to reach a customer. Yeah. Which I just I didn't know which boxes to check, you know. And so the whole marketing thing has also been organic and um, building as we go. And you know, pictures. Honestly, it gets me in trouble sometimes with my my partner here. And <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? On, on Instagram posting. <laughs> Is that really gonna help? <laughs> oh, that is too great. So, so give the listeners at home some advice. You know, maybe, maybe uh, somebody listening is interested in possibly getting into the food industry. What advice would you have uh, for them? Have enough savings 
to not make any money your first and possibly second year. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, and for me, it's whether or not that's through financing or whatnot, but you need yeah. to have like when you're looking for capital, if you're going that direction, you need to include your finances for personal living because you're not going to be making any money your first year. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, go slow. That's, has been our saving grace is slowing down, yeah. stopping sometimes <laughs> yeah. really because things move faster. Our brains move faster than we do. Uh, things around us move faster than we do. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, and so really being centered and, and sticking to what you really want. Yeah. But, yeah. but, you know, don't give up, don't give up. Don't try not to feel the pressure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, don't, yeah, don't try to please um, too many people uh, without, without your own, without your own motives and uh, like you know, initiatives. And the food court community is, is really embracing and really amazing. And um, we, our commissary kitchen, we're in a, a, about seven other food trucks and our neighbors and the other food trucks that we meet out at events and whatnot, we tell them how long we've been doing it. And they, you know, it was our first year or second year, whatever. And every time they just say, you're doing a great job. Keep up the work. Don't give up. The first year is the hardest. I love it. And, I love the community aspect of that. Yeah. Yeah. Even, you know, we, we were with a bunch of taco trucks um, in our commissary and, you know, everybody's just so, they're, we're all here to help each other and um, encouraging very encouraging and um, helpful. Yeah. So, so for the listeners at home that, that want to continue to encourage and, and support what you guys are doing, where do they find you? How, how Rodrigo, how do they find your amazing, you know, advertising on social media? <laughs> how do they, how, how do they, how do they, how do they keep up to date with where the food court is going to be? Well, yeah. Follow us on Instagram at Comida Kin. Um, that is C O M I D A K I N straightforward there and um you know our facebook is linked to the instagram but facebook we don't really interact with too much uh we have our website www.comedakin.com um we, you know we have our farmers up there uh we through the website it takes you to instagram to because we are mobile um it takes you to instagram to to find us and and weekly on instagram i'll tell you where we're at uh or day of, you know, you find us on the day, during the day of, at least in the stories, you'll be able to find something. Perfect. Um, I'm not always the quickest on it, but uh, yep, that's where we're at. And, you know, <laughs> it's one of those things where the pressure is off a little bit because, you know, we have so much going on, but we do still need to, uh, we do still market because not, most of our events are not private. We're just, you know, um, but uh, we do like people to come out to the farms. You know, one of our regular places is, is at Sparrowhawk Farm um, near Glencoe High School. We do lunch out there on Fridays and beautiful place. And, um, you know, they've done, done nothing but embrace us. And, and we go out there weekly. Uh, they, they're, they're working on, they've even worked on the environment around us to, to create a, a better place for people to sit there, sit out and eat on the farm and love it. Take our food, awesome. interact with the farmers, watch them harvest, uh, sell vegetables to the csa members they have a farm store there um, where they, they also support other local businesses through their farm store and that's great uh, you know there's a whole full circle with with you know with them you know spent grain from the brewery to the chickens and you know we give our compost back to them to feed chickens and their pig and pigs and um you know so it, it's fun to be a part of a you know, see those full circle things happening. And, uh, but yeah, uh, social media, Instagram is day of, um, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. That's when we're open. That's, you know, that kind right. of just call it at that and Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, start looking for us and perfect. You should be able to find where we're at. 
Nice. Thank you. Mary and Rodrigo, man, this was such a great conversation. A uh, lot of great information. I'm very excited for what you guys are doing and the way you guys are impacting the community as a whole. I think it's really a phenomenal and the way you're also supporting a lot of these local farmers. It's just a great, great thing. Now for those folks at home, again, you please find them on social media. You can also subscribe to the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter on the shades of e.com, or you can follow us on the shades of e at LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Have a great night.